Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum, dear participants and faculty. Good evening. IPJ is very much delighted on our Professor Fazilatul Nasamali, Madam, is with us. She is extraordinary international cardiologist in Bangladesh, also home and abroad. Uh, he also one of the best presenter I ever seen around the globe. He's a nice presenter. He's one of the favorite presenter. Uh, we are waiting for his excellent talk today. Uh, it's a complication in cath lab and management. She is the right person to speak on it. Professor Wadud sir, please tell something about it. Assalamu alaikum and good evening everybody. Whenever we talk about a cardiac trophy, we want to have good information in a very palatable way. And the presenter should talk it very clearly, precisely, and I should say, in two. Today, you will be uh, delighted by the presentation of Fajila Appa, Professor Fajila Tunnesa Mali, and the use of English language as a very communication, communicative way. We can always learn from Fajila Appa. And as Mohsin has been saying, as a very busy interventional cardiologist, as an administrator of a very busy cath lab, she is very uh, experienced and capable of talking the subject we are going to present today. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Fajilatun Nesamalik. Apa, over to you. So, thank you so much, uh, course directors, uh, for your very kind words. So, course directors, friends, colleagues, and students. It's indeed my privilege and honor to be here today, and I'll be talking about complications in the cat lab and their management. So, obviously, we do not want to have complications in the cat lab. We want to have smooth sailing. But unfortunately, cat lab complications do occur. And the idea is that we need to manage these complications effectively. So without further ado, let's start. I'm going to tell you some stories today. So this is a presentation which is mainly stories. I'm going to tell you stories today. And from these stories, let us uh, discuss and learn. So the first story is a 63-year-old female patient. She came to us with non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Her ejection fraction was 42%. And this is how her angiogram looked. So she had a proximal LAD lesion 90 to 95%, which was involving the osteo of the LAD. And she had lesions in the RCS. Well. The ECM procedure was uneventful, and we managed to fix both the LAD as well as the RC. After doing the PCI, this patient was shifted to the post cat ward with stable hemodynamics. One hour later, she suddenly complained of abdominal discomfort and very rapidly she developed hypotension followed by shock. Uh, the medical officer in the ward looked at the groin. It was absolutely fine. Check and echo was done. There's no pericardial effusion. ECG only shows sinus tachycardia, no other sign, and clinically, the patient is paper -like. With this scenario, she was shifted to the cat lab. Now, we did her coronaries. The coronaries were fine, no stent thrombosis or anything, and the ECG also didn't show that. However, what we found is that there is this central jet of blood going to the retroperitoneum from the external iliac artery. And the amount of blood that is going, as you can appreciate, is so that she has gone into shock within a very short period of time. We have already started her on blood. She's getting blood transfusion, but she, she will not maintain. We need to do something with this uh, jet of blood. So we need to stop it. Otherwise, we will not be able to save her. So with this in mind, what we did is we took a covered step 
a 7 by 18 covered stem and we deployed it at 20 atmosphere pressure for 60 seconds. The perforation sealed up, the patient stabilized, she did require three units of blood and but hard work. We were very thankful to God that we were able to discharge her within uh, three to four days. So this, this is the first story. Let, so what do we learn here? We all know that compared to radial excess, femoral excess complications are more. And in fact, if you do a diagnostic angiogram, the incidence of complications from the femoral excess will be around 1.8, and for intervention procedures, it's around 4%. There can be minor complications like um, ecchymosis or bruising or a small hematoma. Major complications include hematoma, which requires blood transfusion, a retroperitoneal hemorrhage, which our patients suffered from. The patients can end with a pseudoaneurysm, an arteriovenous fistula, arterial dissection, thrombus, embolism. There can be vessel rupture event or limb hysteria. So the major complications, the list is quite long and it is quite daunting. So who are the patients who will be more at risk of vascular complications? So we will try to avoid complications in those patients or by using another route or be by extra careful when we do use the femoral route. So there is certain patient-related risk factors. A female patient, a patient who is elderly, a patient who has low body weight. On the other hand, a patient who is obese, a patient with small body mass index, a patient who is already suffering from peripheral vascular disease, a patient with CKD or a patient with low platelet count. All these patients are at higher risk of de developing femoral artery complications. So for these patients, maybe if possible, we should choose another route like the radial route. Or if we do use the femoral route, be extra, extra careful. But there is such a procedure-related risk factors as well. Like if you during the femoral puncture do multiple punctures, then there is obviously more of a risk that you will end up with a hematoma or some other complications. That's why the first puncture should be the best puncture and you should be able to get the vascular excess with that. Otherwise also, if you use high doses or prolonged the duration of anticoagulants. That's a risk factor. If the patient has previously been given thrombolytic agents or we are using GP2P3 receptor blockers for a patient, we should be extra vigilant that that patient should not develop any femoral fluid excess. If we use larger sheet or we are put a concomitant venous sheet, then that puts our patient at a higher risk. If we keep the uh, catheter, the sheet for a prolonged time, or if a procedure is very complex and we do a very prolonged procedure, that also increases the risk of procedure-related complications. So with all these things, we have to be vigilant. Now, the incidence of retroperitoneal hemorrhage, thankfully, is not that high. It's around 0.1 to 0.5 percent, but that's also quite a big number, isn't it? And it occurs when we do a high femoral puncture. Now, how does the patient present? The patient is hypotensive. The retroperitoneal space is typically innervated by vagal nerve. So there might be bradycardia. Our patient had tachycardia. The, there can be back pain or groin pain, and our patient had abdominal pain. One important clue is that if you take the patient for fluoroscopy, you will see that the full bladder, it will be indented by the retroperitoneal hemorrhage. So how did we manage this patient? Obviously, we need to start blood immediately for our patient because she was already hypotensive and she was paper high white. So we started blood. We sent the blood for hemoglobin investigation and we did that serially to estimate how much blood she lost to give us an idea. 
we had to keep her for a prolonged bed rest. For this patient, we decreased the dose of her antiplatelets, like we gave her a single aspirin and a single clopidogrel. We didn't give, like it's customary to give two, at least two tablets of clopidogrel initially, but we didn't do that. But we didn't totally stop her antiplatelet uh, agents because we had already fixed the uh, leak with the covered agent. Now, if the bleeding is severe, which happened for our patient, we need to identify it very, very promptly. Like maybe another 10, 15 minutes, this patient, we might have lost her. So you have to be very, very quick for all cardiac uh, complications. Being quick and efficient is the key. So you have to be very prompt. We identified it with angiography and treated by a cover. So you need to seal that. But if you cannot do that, or if the damage is such that it will not be uh, taken care of by a covered stent, maybe really you might need surgical correction and evacuation. But obviously, the risk will be very high for surgical correction. Now, one thing that we need to remember is that we always, always have to puncture our femoral artery, the common femoral artery, the part which lies just above the head of the femur. Why? Because this is the best part, the lumen is big, and also because after we remove the sheath, we can press our femoral artery under over the head of the femur. So this will help us in proper hemostasis. And if we do a higher puncture, then what is the risk? The risk is that there might be retroperitoneal hemorrhage, which unfortunately happened for our patient. And if it's a too low down puncture, if we puncture below the bifurcation, then there's a risk of arterial venous malformation, a fistula, or a pseudoaneurysm, and also, of course, of hematoma. So proper positioning of the puncture is also very, very important. So we have to be very careful about this. So let's move to another case. This is a catheter-induced spasm. And the good thing about catheter-induced spasms is that they disappear after you give intracoronary GPN. However, when we are doing, doing an angiogram, often if we see this kind of a uh, stenosis, we immediately jump to the conclusion that, oh God, this is a left main, severe left main disease. But we should always remember that the DD of severe left main disease is maybe a, a catheter-induced spasm. So what is a catheter-induced uh, spasm? A coronary artery spasm during PCI is a reversible narrowing of the lumen of the coronary artery. And it is caused by hyperresponsiveness of the tunica media smooth muscle. How does it occur? It can occur if we have manipulated our catheter a bit too much and our guide catheter has done a deep engagement. Or if we are passing stiff wires, it can also occur during balloon dilatation, it can occur during stent deployment. The good news, however, is that it will promptly respond to intracoronary GTN and intracoronary nicorandil is also very effective. Now, the third case, this is a patient who was a 70-year-old gentleman and he came to us with acute ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. His uh, onset of pain had been two hours back. So we did his angiogram for primary PCI, and we saw that there was a significant stenosis in the proximal LED. However, the good news was that there was no thrombus burden, and the onset of pain was only two hours of duration. So here, what we decided, we decided that we were going to do direct stenting. And that is what is customary in most cat labs when you are doing a primary PCI, obviously you try to do a direct stenting because you do not want to embolize the thrombus. So that's what we did, wired the vessel, took our stent and did direct stenting. We did direct stenting with a three by 30 drug eluding stent and we went up to 14 atmospheric pressure. Just following the uh, stent deployment, 
the patient started complaining of severe chest pain. He became hemodynamically unstable. And as you can appreciate, there is no reflow. So what is no reflow? Coronary no reflow is the inability to perfuse the myocardium after opening a previously occluded or stenosed epicardial coronary artery. The incidence of coronary no reflow is around 0.6 to 2%. So what are the clinical scenarios where you might see coronary no reflow? It can happen during primary PCI as happened in our patient. It can also happen when we are doing very complex uh, angioplastic procedures like maybe a craft vessel PCI. And it can happen following rotavation. Now there are two types of no reflow. One is reperfusion related no reflow, which happened for our patient with primary PCI, or it can be a primary no reflow where there was no actual thrombus burden initially. However, after the procedure, we noticed primary no reflow. The pathophysiology is multifactorial. It can happen due to cellular and interstitial edema, due to endothelial damage, due to platelet fibrin embolization and due to vasospasm. And there is embolization of the platelet and the fibrin and they go and they obstruct the microvasculature. And this leads to the no reflow phenomena. And only when more than 50% of the microvasculature has been obstructed by these platelet aggregates do you see no reflow phenomena. Now, the obvious solution for all complications is preventive. You don't want a complication. You should be aware that this complication can happen in this scenario, and you take adequate measures so that it doesn't happen. So to prevent no reflow, what do we do? Obviously, if you uh, have a very severely degenerated saphenous vein graft, don't do that. Avoid that go and try to fix the native coronary artery. And if it is absolutely mandatory that you need to do a degenerated saphenous vein graft, you should use adequate medications in the rota cocktail when you are doing rota patients. The birth to artery ratio should be around 0.6 or less, then you should lower the rotational speed to around 140,000. And these are the steps you take for rotablation. And during primary PCI, obviously, if the patients are aware, then and uh, there is a good ambulance service, then the minimization of the door to balloon time helps. If there's a huge thrombus burden, even now, for op with operator discretion, we do use manual thrombectomy, and we try to do direct stenting as we did in our patient, but still, even with direct stenting, he developed no reflow. And you can also pre-treat these patients where you suspect there may be no reflow with veraplamine or adenosine. Now, there are certain drugs which are available which can help you to prevent a to no reflow. And once no reflow develops, you also use these drugs. In our CAT lab, we use adenosine and we use uh, uh, verapamil when the patient has bronchial asthma. And when the patient has hypotension as well as no reflow, we use adrenaline. The next complication that I'm going to discuss, now this is a rare and preventable coronary complication during PCI and it is almost always iatrogenic, air embolism. And the incidence of air embolism is around One, the sound of air is more forward low of the time. 
and the patient obviously is complaining of severe chest pain. His pressures have dropped and he is just moving around, wants to sit up. It's a bad situation. So obviously for air embolism also prevention. We have in the syringe or in any of the tubings or anywhere before we inject the dye. We should inject the dye with a 45 degree angle of the syringe. We should also be careful when we are taking out hardware like wires, billing, etc. Because at that time also air might enter. So what do you do? with air embolism so our patient recovered as you can see and these are the steps that we do first of all you need to give the patient high flow oxygen you give the patient atrophy if there is bradycardia you start vasopressors to raise the blood pressure you have to you can take wires and balloons and the you can dilate your balloon to break up the air you can also do catheter aspiration to remove the air and the treatment that we give for no reflow, the standard drugs like adenosine, verapamil, etc. These drugs are also used in air embolism. So let's go to our next case. And this is a patient who came to us for coronary angiograph. So he has good ejection fraction, 60% and he's a 55 year old male. So what happened is that during the coronary angiogram, there was iatrogenic dissection of the left main, and this uh, led to the patient becoming hemodynamically unstable. So when the left main dissects, you have to fix it, otherwise your patient will collapse. So what we did is we immediately changed to a guide catheter after changing to a guide catheter, we wired the vessel and we did direct stenting. We used a 4x12 drug eluding stent, deployed it, did post dilatation, and this was the final result. So, what is a coronary artery dissection? A coronary artery dissection refers to a split or a tear in the wall of the artery, and this creates a flap which compresses or compromises the lumen of the artery, reducing blood flow. And dissection can be uh, classified. So type A is when you give the dye, you can notice minor radiolucencies. However, once the dye is cleared up, the vessel does not show any radiolucency. This is type A. Type B is there are parallel tracks in the vessel, radiolucent areas. This is seen when you give the contrast. And once the contrast clears out, there is slight or no persistence after the dye has cleared up. In C type of dissection, there is an extra luminal cap, and this extra luminal cap persists even after the contrast has been removed. Type D, it is a spiral dissection. Type E, it's, these uh, contains thrombus as well and may manifest as negative filling defects. And type F, that is where there is no forward flow. There is total occlusion of the vessel. So this is how dissections can present. So type A, B, obviously do not require anything much to be done with them. But what are the risk factors for dissection? As we were saying, the catheter-induced dissection, we should all always be careful of this, especially when certain type of catheters are being used, like an amplat shaped catheter. Other possible factors are when we do big manipulations with our catheter. We are not gentle with our catheter. So being gentle with the hardware is absolutely, absolutely uh, mandatory. If the catheter is not coaxial and we give a vigorous contrast injection, this can also uh, cause dissection. Deep intubation of the catheter inside the coronary artery can lead to dissection. If there is an uh, anomalous origin of the ostia and we are not gentle in our uh, searching for the ostia, 
and uh, we do vigorous manipulation that can give rise to dissection. And also, if the patient takes a sudden deep breath and the catheter goes into the vessel suddenly, it can cause a dissection. So all these can lead to dissection and we have to be very careful. And one rule of the thumb is never ever inject the dye unless the catheter is absolutely cold. How do we manage? For the vast majority of the patients, it is conservative management. However, if it's a major dissection, a spiral dissection, or the patient is complaining of chest pain and you think that yes, there is hemodynamic compromise is happening, you need to stent that dissection. For the vast majority of cases, the patient would respond with stenting nowadays. Sometimes when we are unable to stent the dissection, and when can that happen? If the vessel is heavily calcified or very tortuous and we cannot take the stent there, or we, we, after we discover dissection, but we are not able to rewire that dissected segment. In that case, in only 0.2% cases, we would need to stent the patient for surgery. Now, this is a very long story that I would like to share with you. So this was, uh, we presented this case in 2011. And this, we presented this case in the Luzan Complications course. So now, many of you are aware that there is a course in Luzan, Switzerland. Professor Eric Eckhart but organizes it. And uh, in that uh, 2011, I think there were 150 cases that were presented there. The number was submitted was even larger, but they chose 150 cases. And these were from like 68 countries, okay. And this case in 2011, so Bangladesh, this case, because they you know, reflect that they say the country is mentioned. So this case from Bangladesh, this case came second. And we had named this case a twist in the tail. Now the twist being that there is this RC, right? And you can appreciate that the RC, okay, it looks, okay, it looks a fairly easy lesion. But there was a twist. The twist was that there was this very large RV branch going from the RCA. And the RCA had two lesions, as you can appreciate. And uh, uh, the wire would just go into the RV branch. It was not going into the RCA. So what was done is, that the proximal lesion was initially stented with the hope that if the proximal part gets stented, then we can easily negotiate our wire from the RV branch and go to the RCA proper. But due to the severity of the angle, we were unable to do that. So repeatedly trying, still we cannot go to the RCA proper. So what we did is, we used the crusade, which is a double uh, lumen microcatheter, and we used the reverse white technique. I won't go into the details of explaining how we did that because that is not the purpose of this talk. But with the reverse white technique, we were able to wire the RC. Now that, that made us obviously very happy. So after wiring the RC with a lot of techniques, etc., we are very happy with that. So we went on to stand the RC which was a fairly straightforward thing to do. And this was the final result. So now we have done our procedure and we need to And you can see that our happiness suddenly turns into tears, right? You can see the perforation in the distal part of the PDA with the jet coming out from the distal part. So this is a wired perforation, like the wire has gone distally and it has caused a perforation. So the patient uh, went into tamponade, so we immediately had to uh, start pericardiosynthesis. We kept the uh, pigtail in C2 and we were removing the blood. On the other end, what we did immediately also, we took an uh, export catheter and with the help of the export catheter, we put in a coil and we thus thus managed to seal the distal part of the PDA. The uh, bleeding immediately stopped and the patient stabilized. As you can see. So this was the twist. And then uh, 
this had to happen. So one has to be very, very careful about one the wires that one is using and never ever is to make a knuckle with the wire. So a knuckled wire is a safe wire, but otherwise uh, keep a wall. LED, mid LED, lesion. and mid LED are notorious for rupture. So be extra careful and don't go to high pressures with your stent in the mid LED. So here, stent, uh, stenting was done after the balloon pre dilatation. And you, as you can see, a full blown rupture from the LED. Now, this patient is going to go into tamponade immediately. So, what we did is we immediately inflated a balloon at the ruptured side. And this sealed the rupture. We also did pericardiosynthesis at the same time. So you have to, when complications occur, the whole team occurs. So one person is has inflated the <coughs> the other has punctured the vessel and is doing pericardiosynthesis. So once things were settled a bit, we took a deep breath and we knew that this uh, rupture will not go away. If it's a small or bleeding that maybe if you inflate your balloon and keep it for like 40 seconds to a minute sometimes a small perforation might see but not this one so what we did is we took a covered stent and we deployed our covered stent there so the covered stent was 3.8 by 26 it was deployed at 16 atmosphere pressure and this was the final result So the patient was saved by. So you need to have these uh, devices always in your cath lab because catastrophe can happen anytime, even with a simple case. Like this mid LED, this is a five minutes job, right? But it ended up with a perforation. And uh, so one good thing is always check after you've taken the shot, check always distally, proximally, everywhere that everything is fine. And only after that, finish the procedure. So what are the risk factors for coronary artery perforation? Obviously, elderly patients are more at risk, uh, female sex, tortuous and calcified vessels, and small caliber vessels. These are uh, risk factors for perforation. Procedure-related certain factors are like if you oversize your balloon, then there is a risk of perforation, and especially if you are using balloon during PCI. If we go to very high pressure balloon inflation, that is a risk. Stenting of narrow or tapered vessels, stenting of lesions which have already been dissected and then you recross again. During a CTO, during a cephanous vein graft uh, PCI, perforation can occur. During rotavation, it can occur. And also with the Ivers catheter, rupture or perforation can occur. So when we are handling this kind of device, we have to be extra vigilant and extra careful. Now, if we classify coronary perforation, class one is a focal extra Created with this myocardial blush, and three of the chances of getting a tamponade is more than 50%. And these are where you would need to intervene uh, with some kind of device. So, the, obviously, always with all complications, the message is prevention of coronary uh, perforation is mandatory. How do we do that? So, And uh, we should first deploy the stent at a nominal pressure. After we have deployed it, we should take an NC balloon and then post dilate the stent to its optimal size and properly impose our struts. We should be very careful when we use stiff wires and we should not allow 
these wires to go into small side branches, etc. So we should always keep an eye on our wire. Now the in the case where the wire caused the perforation, actually that was just a normal workhorse wire, but we should be extra careful with when we are using stiff wires. And when we do a power ratio low, lower than point eight, ideally around point six. And angulated segments should be avoided during rotation, like in the, during LCX uh, rotation, there are more uh, risk of perforation. How do we manage perforation? Obviously depends on the size of the perforation. If it's a small vessel or a distal vessel perforation, we do call embolization. If it's a large vessel perforation, you need a covered stent. But if the covered stent is not adequate, there's still uh, some jet coming out and you think that it warrants uh, care, then you need to do surgical correction. Uh, proper preparation of the absolutely mandatory. So if it's a heavily calcified, especially in the business. So how we cover the stent? The stent was recovered with the help of a snare. And so the snare was taken and the snare managed to get hold of the stent luckily and luckily that it had embolized down. So what are the strategies of managing a stent loss? Uh, if the stent luckily embolizes, you know, goes to the leg or somewhere where it is safe distally, then maybe uh, no treatment is required for peripherally embolized small stents. You can also deploy your embolized stent with the help of a balloon or a second stand. You can crush the stand into the wall. Some is possible by twisting two wires. And the other thing is that you can inflate a small balloon distant to the embolized stand and if that is the situation and remove the whole system together. Sometimes during excessive manipulation of the wire, the wire may get broken. Like while trying to open this CTO, uh, excessive wire manipulation caused the wire to crack and break. So there is the wire lying in the LED, you know, it needs to be removed. Uh, so what was done is a parallel wire was taken and then a balloon was taken and uh, inflated at the distal tip of the guide catheter. And the whole assembly was very gently pulled back and the whole assembly came out. So you have to just get the whole thing out. But at least uh, the wire came out and that is the best thing that happened. <clears throat> when we are stenting a vessel, especially when you are stenting the left wing, choose your stent wisely. A stent with a good radial stent is absolutely mandatory when you are doing a PCI of the left wing. Now for this 60-year-old male patient who was undergoing PCI of the left wing, uh, this is his lesion. Very tight palliation was initially done because especially for and you really need to prepare your bed well. After the dilatation, a 4 by 12 drug eluting stent was taken and it was deployed. Post dilatation was done. Immediately after stent deployment, things look fine. But suddenly we see that the stent is collapsing on itself and the patient starts uh, getting a bit restless and uncomfortable. What did we do? We immediately took another second stent and we deployed it at that site. So this is the sandwich technique. And the final result was this. So our patient settled down. So stent of the, the radial strength of your stent is very important in certain situations. Otherwise it can 
uh, give rise to unforeseen complication. And not only the radial strength, you also need a properly sized, proper, a proper length stent as well. Like in the severe osteo left wing disease, after pre-dilatation, uh, a 3.5 by 8 drug eluting stent was taken, a small and short stent. Stent was deployed, post-dilatation done. Stent looked fine, the whole procedure is about to end. And then the next shot, you see that the stent is not there in the left wing. Uh, we didn't have time to look for our uh, runaway stent because the patient has started to get rested and, and uh, start complaining of chest pain. So what we did is we took a second stent, <laughs> a larger stent, a 4 by 15 drug eluting stent this time. We deployed it and after that, this was the final result. And after a patient had settled down, we started looking for the runaway stent and we found that it was outside the catheter. So a snare was taken and the stent was removed. So when we uh, do PCI, our stent should be absolutely of the proper size and also of the proper length. Sometimes during even a simple procedure, there may be unforeseen uh, complications like abrupt occlusion of a branch. Like in this 60-year-old female patient, she came to us with non-ST segment elevation in mind. And this is how our coronaries looked. So there was a dissecting lesion in the left wing, which was involving the origin of the LAD and the LC. But to us, we felt that the LCX looked pretty decent. And our plan was that we would do a provisional stenting for the left wing. So we would try with a single stent strategy and see how it goes. So after um, proximal optimization with a single stent from the left main uh, to the LAD, this is the final result. And we were quite happy with it. And as you can see, the LCX also looked fine. We thought this was the end of the procedure. But while the patient was be shifted, being shifted from the, uh, in the cat lab, she was being shifted to the trolley, the ward boy and the sister, they noticed that she is starting to complain of chest pain. So they called us and we went and we saw that, yes, she is complaining of chest pain. So we immediately put her back on the cat lab immediately again. And um, she was sweating a bit. We did a check angiogram and the check angiogram revealed that the LCX was getting almost subtotally occluded with thrombus and there was TME1 flow. And the patient was very symptomatic. So we immediately uh, started wiring the vessels. The patient became bradyc developed bradycardia and the bradycardia was not responding to atropine. So she, we had to do temporary pacemaker as well. The LED and the LCX were uh, wired quickly. After wiring these vessels, what we did is we decided to do a tap technique. Obviously, that would be the easiest. And the angle also, fortunately, was suitable for a tap technique. So we opened the strut uh, with a 2 by 15 balloon. And then we took a 2.75 by 18 drug eluting stent uh, and deployed it in the LCX with the tap technique. We did final kissing as is mandatory for a double strength strategy, and this was the final result. Sometimes uh, things can get even more messier. Like in this 50 year old male, he had a very straightforward uh, stenting of first the LED. And then the LCS. So straightforward stenting of these two vessels. And the patient was sent to the uh, post-cat ward with stable hemodynamics. Now, two hours after the procedure, the patient suddenly developed cardiac arrest in the post-cat ward. This was followed by respiratory arrest. Immediately, CPR was started. The patient was intubated in the post-cat ward and taken to the cat lab. CPR was being continued, and we did his check angiogram. So we put in a TPM as well, CPR is going on, and this is how it looks. Total occlusion with thrombus, both of the LED and the LCX. So we wired both vessels, obviously, 
we barcode vessels, we sent the blood for to check for ACT. The ACT came low. We gave more bolus of heparin. We started the patient on GB2B3 receptor blockers. This case was actually like 10 years ago. So we didn't have bivalent routine at that time. We had bivalent routine for a bit, then it went off, right? So now what we did is we did repeated, we started repeated thrombus aspiration. So repeated thrombus aspiration both in the LAD and in the LCX was done. We gave the patient intracoronary GTN. And this intracoronary GTN sort of helped jumpstart the heart. This is one thing that helps, I think. Like if your patient is really crashed, give the patient intracoronary uh, adrenaline. Not GTN, I'm sorry. It was intracoronary adrenaline that we gave. So you give, uh, you take one ampoule of adrenaline and then you divide it into 20 parts. So 120 we give and then we go on increasing at the dose. If you give the full ampoule of adrenaline, what happens is it suddenly shoots the pressure and then the pressure goes down. But if you sort of just gradually increase, it jump starts the heart and it really helps. So we gave the patient intracoronary adrenaline. After, so with the adrenaline, the patient sort of, uh, as I said, the heart started moving and we did thrombus aspiration quite a bit and it sort of resolved. We later on changed the patient's, uh, 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 no, the patient was uh, on topidogrel and aspirin. This was quite a bit ago. Uh, so, and uh, this patient lived. This is the greatest thing. So, actually, you know, we all took a photo with him the day that he was discharged because it was such a miracle that he had survived. So, prompt action. If emergencies happen, prompt effective action is also something that helps save our patients. And stem thrombosis can complicate around 2% of coronary interventional procedures. Obviously, stent thrombosis is associated with significant morbidity and mortality, and there is a high risk of myocardial infarction as well as death. So what are the causes that can lead to stent thrombosis? There are certain stent factors, like if the, uh, there is hypersensitivity to the drug coating or the polymer, and the patient can develop stent thrombosis. If there is incomplete endothelization, this was more common in, when we had first generation drug eluting stents because of the permanent non erodible polymer, uh, the healing was delayed, and often patients had incomplete endothelization. There may be certain factors in the strength design which can uh, cause uh, stent thrombosis. And another thing we need to remember is cover stents that we use for coronary artery rupture, these are also more prone to stent thrombosis. So these are stent factors. What are the patient factors? If the patient has presented to us with an acute coronary syndrome, there is a more chance that he may develop stent thrombosis. If the patient is diabetic, if the patient has chronic kidney disease, if the patient has poor ejection fraction, if the patient, for whatever reason, stops his dual antiplatelet prematurely, or if the patient has clopidogrel resistance or aspirin resistance, or the patient, this is just theory. No, nowadays, no one does brachytherapy, but if the patient had brachytherapy, or the patient has malignancy, or if uh, saponous vein graft is treated, then patients can suffer stent thrombosis. Lesions also, like if the lesion is very, very long, if the uh, lesion is very not narrow, if, the, if it, we do a complex PCI, like a bifurcation lesion, because you're putting in more metal mass there, or you open up a chronic total occlusion, uh, we've already said saphenous vein grafts, these are lesion characteristics which make uh, the chances of stem thrombosis low. And procedural factors. So in acute stem thrombosis, the procedural factors are also very important. Like if there is inadequate stent expansion, if there is incomplete stent acquisition, we have to make sure with post dilatation that the stent struts are properly opposed to the vessel wall. If the stent struts are hanging there, this is a sure recipe for stent thrombosis. So if there is inadequate stent expansion, if there is incomplete stent acquisition, if 
uh, we deploy the stent in a necrotic core or if they, at the edge of the stent there is dissection, then all of these procedural factors can lead to stent uh, thrombosis. So stent thrombosis can be a definite stent thrombosis like in our case because we uh, showed that there was stent thrombosis with angiography or if they, during autopsy stent thrombosis is found, then this is definite stent thrombosis. Otherwise, it is a probable stent thrombosis or a possible stent thrombosis. When stent thrombosis occurs within 30 days of the procedure, we call it early stent thrombosis. When it develops within one, after one month, but within one year, we call it late stent thrombosis. And only if it crosses one year, we call it very late thrombosis. When we were dealing with the first generation drug eluding stents, we were having a lot of in cases, very late stent thrombosis. Because as I was saying, due to the permanent non-erodible polymer, these stents did not heal properly. So when there is acute stent thrombosis, this can be treated with balloon angioplasty uh, and uh, uh, we can do thrombus, of course, to do thrombus suction. But repeat stenting is usually not done. What's the use of giving more metal mass? But if you see a definite dissection and that dissection is causing the stent thrombosis, then you should obviously cover that dissection with the stent. Now, these are the, the, this is a late complication that we saw. So this was, this case was, uh, came from, uh, was done in another center and this patient was admitted in our hospital because he was complaining of chest pain. And uh, uh, here, as you can see, there was this huge aneurysm was seen in the uh, LCX and following PCI. So this happened a few months after PCI, this is huge aneurysm. And obviously this aneurysm has the risk of bursting. And this is uh, Dr. Ashok Dutta's case that he uh, treated very efficiently. So what did he do? He wired the vessel. After wiring the vessel, he had to seal the aneurysm. So how did he seal it? Because it's so large. Uh, so what he did is, he did coiling of the vessel. So basically, he just coiled the vessel and put a stop to the flow. So the huge aneurysm, this was really, really large. I've never seen such a large aneurysm actually in my life. We had smaller aneurysms that we treated with cover stent, but this really is a very dramatic presentation. So what is a coronary aneurysm? A coronary aneurysm represents an abnormal dilatation of a coronary artery and it is typically defined by the presence of an enlarged segment greater than 1.5 times the diameter of a normal adjacent segment. The incidence is around 1.5 to 5%. It most commonly affects the RCA followed by the LED and lastly it affects the LCX. So LCX aneurysm is usually not that common. Etiology, it can be due to atherosclerotic degeneration, Kawasaki's disease, infection, polyarthritis nodosa, Takayoshi's arteritis, connective tissue disorders like Marfan's or Ehlers Danlos, and iatrogenic if there is deep vessel injury during TCI by a balloon or stent. And in the first generation drug eluting stents, aneurysms were not uncommonly seen as well, where there was delayed healing. Gradually, gradually, the water would get thin and you would see aneurysms there. Vast majority of aneurysms will be asymptomatic. However, we need to be aware of the complications like this aneurysm that we just saw was so huge that it would rupture any time, right? It was massive enlargement. But rupture is a very rare complication. But patients with aneurysms may uh, come with uh, myocardial infarction due to distal embolization or in situ thrombus formation. How do we treat aneurysms? Along with DAPT, we give these patients oral anticoagulants. We uh, can use cover stent for aneurysms. In this case, coil embolization was done. And if it's uh, uh, not amenable to these maneuvers, then surgery may be considered. 
But this is a very, very long history. This case we actually did as a life is life is what happens, some patients have such you know long history, one thing happening after the other. And such was the case for this patient. So this was a 55-year-old gentleman, a migrant work worker, and he had a primary PCI done in 2016 in Bangladesh to the RCA. He used to work in Kuwait, and in 2018 in Kuwait, he underwent CAEG. A few months later, he developed chest pain. They did check angiogram, and they found that all his drafts had occluded. So what they did is they did uh, left me to LAD PCA, PCI, they did a put a stent in the LCX to bone. So they did PCI to the patient. And a few months later, he again developed chest pain. This time he was in Bangladesh and we did his angiogram. And this is uh, how it looked. So as you can <clears throat> appreciate, there is severe ISR in the left main as well as in, uh, there is a 99% uh, lesion in the origin of the LCS. So the poor patient, he has already had CABG. After CABG, he, he has had a PCI. And there is ISR of the stent that was put in his left main. And no, uh, there is also severe osteal lesion in the LCS. And this was actually a live case that we did. Uh, and... Uh, what we did is, that's a very long procedure, we won't show that, but we did DK crush, okay? And the DK crush result was very satisfactory and we could see with OCP that it was, uh, the result was satisfactory. This was the final shot, but one of the panelists right at the end said that he was concerned with the osteo of the LCA, so he asked us to do an IVUS at the very last moment. We also did an IVUS and the IVUS also showed that the, uh, all the struts were open and the bifurcation was fine. So this is just to illustrate that restenosis is something that can come and haunt us any time, even not just right at the cat lab, but six months down the road from the cat lab. And uh, uh, instant restenosis is something that we don't really look forward to. So what is this? Well, instant restenosis is an angiographic, uh, uh, it's a definition, it's an angiographic definition, and it means that there is recurrent diameter stenosis of more than 50% in the stent segment or at its edges. So instant restenosis can happen inside the stent or even within five millimeters of the stent. And depending on where it is, it can be focal or it can be uh, very proliferative. So obviously the proliferative ones are the ones where the patient gets symptomatic. So there are factors responsible for instant restenosis. One is patient related, obviously. And again, it's elderly patients, female patients, patients with a diabetes mellitus or some genetic predisposition that makes these patients prone to instant restenosis. It can be lesion related like if the lesion is very long and diffuse and we've used multiple stents or in case of osteo lesion in case of bifurcation in very narrow caliber blood vessels also the chances of instant restenosis is uh, higher and in multivessel coronary artery disease where you've used multiple stents procedure related the stent type obviously in bare metal stents you get more instant restenosis than you get in trabeluting stents the length of the stents. If it's a, multiple stents have been put back to back, then there is always chance that there might be instant restenosis. If there is stent overlap, multiple stents with overlap, at the overlap side, you might get instant restenosis. If you do not expand your stent properly, there's stent under expansion, then this can lead to instant restenosis. Also, if a patient had a history of instant restenosis to one vessel, you should remember this when you go and put another stent in another vessel. There is always a chance that he will also develop instant restenosis in that vessel as well. So clinical presentation, most instant restenosis patients will be asymptomatic. Some who uh, might present with stable angina, but also if there is rupture of the new atherosclerotic plug, the patient may come with acute coronary syndrome. So if the patient is symptomatic with stable angina 
what can we do for that patient? We can do COBA. We can uh, to use a cutting or a scoring balloon at the site of instant stenosis. We can use a drug coated balloon there, but the first three these we can do only if the uh, stenosis is inside the stent. It has not spread five millimeters on the ether side. If the stent is severely underexpanded or is calcified, then we can do rotablation, do just ablate the stent and then put a new stent. And if the uh, instant restenosis is very extensive and it extends, in the, there is any stent restenosis as well, extending outside of the stent, then maybe we can uh, do pre dilatation and then put in another drug diluting stent at that site. So in conclusion, I've come to the end of my discussion. The message that I want to tell you is that obviously prevention is better than cure. So try to avoid complications in the cat lab by always being vigilant and very watchful during a procedure. Constantly monitor your patient during the procedure as well as afterwards for early detection of any complications that may arise inadvertently. The cat lab needs to be always fully equipped with all items that might be required should an emergency arise. And when the emergency arises, the team needs to be ready and well prepared to deal efficiently and effectively with any complications. And as I always say, the strength of Heart Foundation is our cat lab team. And from the entire team, uh, there were other some cases which were contributed by some of who are sitting here. So thank you uh, for being such an excellent team and for being there always. Whenever a complication arises, the whole team oh. goes there and we solve that problem. So thank you for being the best team ever. And with that, I would like to say thank you to all of you for being such patient listeners. So thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fodirakim Samali. What a nice case-based and Practical demonstration in lecture class. We are not only participants, we are faculty learn how to present a lecture with a case based discussion. So we are really delighted for your lecture. Uh, for the sir, please tell something. Sir. I have been already uh, forecasting that we will have a very pleasurable experience. Uh, my uh, uh, reasoning was very much correct. Uh, it was a very wonderful presentation for the LAPA. And with such a beautiful case-based manifestation of what you are actually saying and how to tackle these problems. It was really wonderful. Uh, I have one question uh, before they start. Appa, you, can, you should remain unmuted. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Appa, one question is that uh, in case of Lachman stenosis, uh, you were saying the, the proper radial strength should be taken into account while we are choosing a stand. Uh, in your experience, which stand actually were you using in your cat lab mostly for this purpose? I'm, no, actually, you see, first of all, I would say that uh, most of the drug diluting stands nowadays that are available in the market are very effective and it is uh, operator's choice as well. Like in our uh, hospital, Different operators use different stents, uh, so uh, like uh, uh, and in different situations might choose a different stent. We have more than 2,000 cases of left main PCI that we have done in our hospital, and in 50% of the cases we used a Zotulimus illusion stent, and in uh, uh, like uh, uh, I think uh, 28 or 29 percent it was a Evolimus illusion stent, and the rest was other like Biolimus. So, so the choice depends, but uh, one thing that the operator should do is use a stent that you are comfortable with, that you know, that you know, like if, if you know that this stent has great radial strength, you know that it will give you great side branch accessibility, you know that, you know, it will go through tortuous vessels. So like personally, I also have my own stent that I prefer. Everyone has their own stent, but whatever stent you're using, try to use a stent that is FDA approved. Definitely, when you're doing a left main PCI, do not compromise on that. And also use a stent that you are comfortable with. Thank you, Dr. Professor Dr. Mamun Sidabai. 
प्रोफेसर मोहन सिजल यस मोहन सिजल थैंक यू फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल प्रोफेसर फजिला अप्पा फॉर नाइस डेलीवरेशन एंड हाईली इनफॉर्मेटिव द लेक्चर एज ऑलवेज एज ऑलवेज एंड Uh, i want Thank to say you. that uh, we are always enjoying our lecture and with in this case the all the complication of the cat lab is demonstrated with the case by demonstration uh, one thing i want to share that uh, regarding the stent thrombosis of uh, you in one case uh, when the uh, patient already had a stent uh, one is stent in the, in the vessels then sometimes uh, i i ex have experienced that uh, uh, one of my patient having the left uh, led stenting four or five years back uh, five years after he came with the chest pain and diagnosis non stmi with lcx stenosis and i am trying to negotiate the wire it is a little bit uh, secure type and taking time uh, in this time uh, patient suddenly chest pain and uh, uh, fortunately we are working in the lcx and just uh, giving the shot then we see the the stent in the led is a uh, thrombus body and then we give wire and and the thrombus by this time patient's cardiac arrest was developed and cpr was going on and this time uh, after wiring just uh, thrombus suction uh, we can uh, the establish the flow and again we came to the lcx and doing the pci and in this case what is your opinion that um, should we uh, more cautious have any patient with the already in one stent in vessels and uh while well, stenting in another vessels any caution should be taken regarding the uh, anticoagulation or something well uh, congratulations on handling a very difficult situation to your patient who was safe because when you do uh, complex cases complications might arise but the, to bring the patient safely is our aim right so do you manage that and congratulations Congratulations for that. What I feel here is that this is a common thing that can happen with CTOs. When we are engrossed in opening one CTO, sometimes we exceed. Because obviously, when we do a normal case, maybe we can finish it in ten, fifteen times. But when ten, fifteen minutes, right? But when we are opening up a CTO, we get so engrossed. Thirty minutes, forty minutes is going. We do not check the ACV. so when uh, cto is being done i think one of the team members like in our cat lab what we have we have some sisters who will come and say you know 30 minutes have gone should i go and check the act now so if the act was checked maybe the procedure was so prolonged that the act came down and there was thrombus in your uh, uh, led was created also another thing is uh, sometimes you know thrombus may get you know created in the catheter itself so during a prolonged procedure thrombus might even form in the catheter maybe in the tip of the catheter and during the procedure if someone gives a die and that thrombus will obviously go into the lvd so during prolonged procedures i think we need to you know have someone who checks the ct a few times your procedure you said the lcx was a cto and obviously time was prolonged so maybe due to that prolonged time the act went down and thrombus was formed either in situ in the led or inside the catheter may i put in something up as you were saying up already you were only saying. one stent went previously in the led is this and you contribute I more risk more risk any Uh, one stand already in the stand should we more cautious uh, regarding this case okay. yeah. but but your your you placed the stand a few years back it wasn't done that time na no? you said that yeah. that stand so that stand is already endothelialized most likely if it is a second yeah. and third generation stand most likely it was already endothelialized if it is a first generation stand then we have that issue but it's always okay. uh, i mean a patient who has already had a pci obviously he has a lot of atherosclerotic burden thank you what do you say something uh, uh, yeah so what uh, uh, 
I think uh, most of us has the same experience because almost all of these cases, either the ICT was not taken or the system forgot to give the heparin. It has been said that, that is a very intervention, is, intervention should give the heparin himself or herself. That's I a think, very important thing. You I think that's make sure. very important. Uh, another thing is that uh, whenever the procedure crosses one hour, check the ICT again. Make a rule in your cat lab. That really helps. We have so. some scary situation like that. And once upon a time, we do have some really problem with fake heparin, heparin as well. Thank you, sir. In the COVID pandemic era, we are uh, encouraged to see lots of participants there, 180 yeah. participants. Also, Professor Mohammad Jalaluddin, sir, with us. Jalal, sir, Jalal, sir, with us. Mohammad 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 Jalal, sir, with us. Thank you so much. Shabaji Ashton. Thank you so much. I have a great show. 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 Jalal, sir. Could you tell something, sir? Mr. Jalal, sir. Sir, I am mute, sir. Jala sir, you are on mute. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. 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 Uh, mature one now. Today I am telling that uh, well I was professor of cardiology in NICVD. Kozila was my registrar. At the time I was doing some angiogram, pacemaker, but not any uh, intervention. At the time intervention was not started in our country. Only that she was assisting me in pacemaker and simple angiogram. Now I am so happy that Bachame has become mature doing so many angiogram, angioplasty, and complicated angioplasty, and also facing the complications and treating those young complications very uh, mm -hmm. successfully. I'm so happy. So thank you, sir. Sir, you are a Sir, I'm going to shop at Sarisha to come to Bishiba Kikan or Jarai. That has a shop by Sarisha to come to see. Sign a shop, sir. After the shop, I kept Halo she kills and sir. Eternal Ashul got us after Halo teacher chillen, sir. Sir, it came to look. Thank you, sir. Another thing, the father of Professor Puzilatana, sir, Professor Pigader Abdul Mali, was my teacher while I was in PG hospital. Later on, I am the first man of his, his students to join as his assistant in newly developed, newly started NICVD in 1979. I was very happy and I was fortunate to work with him. That later on, I also became the director of the institute before my writing. It was my fortunate and I, I, am, I feel uh, very, very much gratitude to, gratitude to my professor, Brigadier Abdul Malik. And later on, I, he was my teacher, and I was his, the teacher of his daughter. I am the intermediate person. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I am very happy that Dr. Fuzulat Nasta faced so many complications. That's and sad. also, because he was doing so many angiogram and endoplasty, naturally every cardiologist who are doing more cases, they will face more complications. And I think, and he has shown 
the quite a good number of cases of complication, but he has managed very successfully. Thank you, Professor Fuzula Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Mohan Jawan, sir. Sir. Yeah. You also evidence nice of see. complications. <laughs> nice to see a lot of face. Actually, it's a beard down there. But there, I come back. Nah, the bar po hoy na. Bar po ko ekta ekhane kono khawa da hoy nai. Nah, sir. Salaam alaikum, sir. Yes, salaam alaikum. Nice, sir. For example, actually, I'm like by the day, just almost night mirror. Dekhi almost she cover uh, almost everything. Yeah. Almost uh, everything. Possible almost. application almost. in cat lab. Thank you, for example, a unique uh, case based discussion of. Almost all the cases within short possible time of one Thank hour. So basically, uh, there is nothing new to to tackle all these things. We know it. How to tackle? We also know it. But because of ignorance and sometimes late identification of complication, sometimes we've lost the patient. So my uh, simple word is just: no case is simple. Think every case can land up with complication. Is not that. Uh, ask your junior to do the case, and you will be just outside the hospital or outside the cath lab. It may land up with a complication when you will be uh, uh, in time to handle those cases. So, first thing, every case should be considered as a as a potential complicated case. Second, the the care should be taken from the right from the puncture to end of the lab, and also first 24 hours. After the procedure in CCO for hemodynamic monitoring, if not yourself, the junior should look for certain things that we know, so that we can quickly identify the pro probable complication. The Fazila showed two interesting cases, and it is almost deadly situation. One is the left hand complete occlusion with the LRD and RCA. If it was not been done properly, proper means that within I should say within five minutes. And other one was the retropatal hematoma. These two things, if you don't identify in time, whatever you do, the result may not be uh, uh, good, as I'm sure. The same thing happened to many of us. Some survived, some didn't uh, survive. If you compare these things, how, why it happened, is simply because of uh, late identification of the complication. And there should be a very good teamwork because if if in, in your cath lab, if everybody is uh, in the attention and, and focus on the case, and if the there is uh, no panic, where the most problem arises, the operator shout right and left, and everybody is scared to handle. Be quiet, and there should be team effort. If necessary, ask your colleague. I should say, not junior. Ask your colleague to come and wash. It will, it will, it will give a lot of uh, uh, relief of your stress. Mere presence of your colleague in the lab is enough to give a good amount of mental strength to handle the case. Third one is that you should also involve at least in the surgical team. Surgery. 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 And you should be innovative. So these are small, small things. If you keep in mind, you can avoid complication. And even if it happen, you can deal complication right time with right devices. This, to me, I think this is in a nutshell, I can say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before going to the panelist and ask question, one question, one of the, one of the uh, faculties from the Nepal, Dr. Shumir, Shumir Powdell, please ask your question. Who do your question? Dr. Shumir Powdell from Nepal. You please unmute. Dr. Shumi. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 We are here. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your nice presentation. Uh, my question is: uh, When there is a uh, aneurysm, coronary artery aneurysm in a big vessel, uh, then uh, willing the cor coronary aneurysm, coronary artery aneurysm, uh, has a great risk of uh, developing ischemia. Then how can you tackle that? If the vessel is very small, there is no problem. It's all right. But for a big vessel, as uh, you showed uh, in your sli uh, slides, how, how do you manage that? Actually, you know, uh, this uh, for uh, 
large vessels, you should uh, not be routinely calling. Right? But the case that I showed that was unique. You can appreciate that. There was this huge, giant aneurysm, right? And it was sort of occluding the whole vessel anyway. The LCX was practically not serving any purpose for that patient due to that huge, giant aneurysm. And the aneurysm was of such a size that it could rupture any minute. And if it ruptures, it would be all understand be completely uh, a catastrophe for the patient. It would lead to a fatality. So here, the operator had no option but to call that uh, uh, aneurysm because it was a, it was uh, not serving any purpose. So as you have rightly said, for a large vessel, we would normally never call a large vessel because if we call a large vessel, obviously we are basically causing obstruction to the flow of blood to a huge amount of myocardia. And if that that case is not well collateralized, there will be definitely a lot of problems for the patient. So normally, in a large vessel, we do not use calls. In this unique situation, call was used because uh, the the Aneurysm was of such, uh, of a, such a magnitude that it had to be closed. And also, uh, it is my understanding that this patient had a lot of comorbidity, which was making him an uh, unsuitable candidate for surgery as well. So he had been already refused surgery. So the only option for this patient was the colony. Thank you, ma'am. In general, Appa, when there is a large aneurysm involving a big vessel, mm -hmm. and that uh, heart is dependent on the flow of that vessel, uh, the choice of uh, is surgery. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, surgery. the choice is surgery. But for this patient... In this patient, it was very good. Oshoka has done a very, very good job. Yes. And that was Thank a wise you. decision, actually. Doctor, uh, one of the COVID fighters is here. Dr. Kaisar Masullah Khan. He's come back um, with us after COVID fighting. Dr. Kaisar Masullah Khan. Do you hear me? Kaisar Bhai? We are all COVID fighters. He's a COVID star. He survived COVID. Uh, uh, yeah. This is the COVID star. Oh, I think so. Kaiser, why do you hear me? Yes, sir. Unmute yourself. I think he's. And he's not uh, at present. Dr. Khalid Mosin. Dr. Khalid Mosin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, madam. Uh, it was a really a superhuman effort to cover so many complications with illustration in one hour time. You started from the puncture to the wear tip. Uh, so actually, uh, the. Uh, the perforation of the coronary artery is the more, probably the uh -huh. most dreadful complication in the cath lab. So I want to have your expert opinion regarding uh, the partial reversal of anticoagulation and use of a second puncture and a second guide catheter to so put a cover. Yeah, you're what's, talking your, what, yeah what's, what's your opinion uh, regarding uh, LS3? perforation dealing actually just to... right so a very good question and thank you Khalid uh, so as usual Khalid is the academician and he is asked a real academic question so thank you for the question and uh, it's uh, uh, true that uh, in uh, certain cases the ping pong technique is used and that is very effective like if you have a huge puncture and you want to safeguard it as well so what you've done, what is done is from the anti-grade part, you pass a balloon and you inflate that. So you have already sealed the perforation. But the perforation is of such a magnitude that when you deflate and remove it and then take your covered step, you feel that you do not have enough time to do that. Removing the balloon and then putting the covered step, your patient will collapse. So what you do, you keep your uh, balloon inflated at that side. And from the other side, you do another puncture. You take another guide catheter. And through that guide catheter, you wire your vessel. After wiring, you just deflate for a second and let your wire pass distant. You inflate your balloon again. Now through this other catheter, you take your covered step. And you... Take your covered stain as near as possible. You deflate your balloon, pull it back, put the covered stain, and uh, you're set. Thank God and touch wood, I have not as yet needed to do this in my lifetime, and I do not want to do it. But this is called the ping pong technique. And this, and, and, and I would also like to mention here that all these, the sequence that I have covered 
of complications, the tables and charts that I have used, these were all taken from manual for uh, intervention. And this NHF manual of intervention, the complications chapter was written by a very talented doctor, Dr. Pulimuthu. And in, in that chapter, he describes the ping pong technique as well. So if anyone wants to Madam, have a look at this. Regarding, technique, regarding uh, re re reversal of uh, uh, heparin, I don't know, you know, I'm very hesitant about reversing heparin. I will check the ACT. Madam, but I, 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 I usually do not want to reverse the heparin because I don't want to end up. So I, uh, I've got a perforation and then I might end up with a, a stent uh, thrombosis. So I check the ACT. We, in our hospital, we check uh, uh, the ACT, but if it is, we have a, Usually, do not use quota. The Kaiser, do you hear me? Kaiser, do you hear me? Kaiser, do you hear me? Okay, Dr. Dr. Birat, do you hear me? He's from Nepal. He's lots of questions he asked in the chat box. Dr. Birat, you asked your question now. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, there are a few questions that I'd like to ask uh, here. So, uh, regarding the coronary dissection, ma'am, so uh, how do we know when to leave it alone and manage it conservatively? Are there any criteria? That is the first sure. question? So, yes, for dissections, like anything else, you look at your patient, right? Your patient is stable, there is no chest pain hemodynamically no change, no ECG changes. And it's just, uh, you know, like uh, type A or B type of thing in the angiography. So you can leave it like you place the stem and at the edge of the stem, there is this slight type A type of dissection. Maybe you can leave it. But uh, where is that dissection as well? Is it in a, but if it is in a major vessel like uh, which happened in the left main. So you know that right. you cannot afford to, to leave it, right? Very so symptoms, symptoms is one thing that is very important. How is your patient doing? Where is the dissection? And what type of dissection is it? If it's totally occluding your vessel, of course you need to do something. If it's a spiral dissection, you need to do Hello. something. If it's in the left main, you need to do uh, something. Uh, so it will vary from... Uh, Situation to situation. Um, thank you, Actually, second... one of the things to do, uh, if you suspect there is a slight slow fluid, some air dissection, just wait there in the cath lab. Five minutes, seven minutes, and do uh, see again, uh, uh, checking you with whether the flow is quite all right. If it's settled down, I think APA as well, APA was saying, they can leave it alone. Uh, Wadud well, is quite right. Uh, uh, give some time to follow up the patient in the cath lab. If patient is no, not hemodynamically unstable, then we can wait for some time. If it is grade two, up to grade two, then uh, we can use the uh, balloon for, for some time. It's a pressure uh, up to uh, 15, 20 or 25 minutes up to pressure. And then patient, if it is uh, stable, there's no need to for the Poverty stent or something others. That's a great suggestion, also. So, you can do a balloon inflation and then at least uh, keep it for uh, 45 seconds, one minute, uh, or as long as your patient tolerates, deflate it, see how the anti grade flow is. If it is, in many instances, a small dissection will see by itself. That's a great suggestion that Caesar just gave us now about doing balloon inflation at the site. Of Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Other question. One, one, yeah. one more question, ma'am. Uh, in cases of perforation, ma'am, how long do we inflate the balloon before deflating, and at what pressure do we inflate it? And do we inflate at the site of perforation or proximal to it? And if there is no extra resistance after uh, deflation of balloon, do we need uh, to stent with a cover stent in all the cases? Okay, so, uh, Caesar has already answered the question, right? that if you uh, can do a balloon inflation and you wait and you see that it has uh, sealed, then uh, you can uh, uh, 
just leave it like that, right? It's sealed and you wait for some more minutes, you check with your ACP, everything is settled. Then touch wood, okay, you're in safe hands and you don't need to do anything. You don't need a covered set. That is a very nice situation that can happen. But uh, actually, his, his question was about the cycle. How, how many minutes yes. you want to inflate right. and deflate yes. for how so, long time? So, so that that absolutely depends on how long your patient tolerates. Like if if the patient is tolerating prolonged balloon uh, inflations, you will try to you know you will try to inflate your balloon to the maximum tolerance level of your patient. So if your patient is tolerating, fine, keep it inflated and then do it. But if he's not tolerating, then you will have to deflate and again inflate very. So it will vary. There is no like I would feel a hard and fast rule that okay I can have to uh, I can do it for one minute or two minutes or 45 seconds it depends and it will vary from patient to patient but obviously you want to prolong the time of, uh, of uh, uh, your inflation so the actually case, for a case of CTO which is getting a retrograde feeling from the other vessel other side you can, uh, you can actually go for prolongation because it was already it was wow. closed before Wadud, can I can I you may take one question uh, yeah, ask, please, uh, please. Uh, th thank you, thank you, madam, uh, for nice uh, presentation. I like to add, madam, is there any rule to inflation of the balloon for uh, three times and see the, the die? And if it is not improved at all, then go to uh, cover stand. It actually almost. Thank you for your question, but I, I'm actually and I personally am not. Please cycle. Out. I'm not aware of this, but if you know about it, please actually do tell us. So is there something like this? Is the three cycles or something? I mean, no, have you, have no, you read some? Uh, there is no uh, like that hard and fast rule. Actually, I I have one experience. 30 minutes. I, I, mean, 30 minutes. I inflated up to 25 minutes. Patient uh, afford it and I inflated up to 25 minutes. And I do not know about the OMOL, what is saying that is three cycle or I do not know that is this. That is 30 second, 30 minutes we can wait and then see. If Operation, for preparation, yeah. So, so, so after 30 minutes, if it seals, that is very good news, right? So you appreciate. And sometimes like uh, the LAD case, the perforation was so huge, you know, even if you sat there for the whole day, it would not seal, right? This also, uh, the size of the perforation, first visual impression also gives us an idea. Sometimes also, na, this will seal, this most likely will not be sealing. So uh, for that which will not seal, uh, to safeguard the patient maybe, and if you have the cover standard, and I think that we should just go and use it. Just to, you know. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kaiser with us. Kaiser, Kaiser why? do you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, Alhamdulillah, welcome, they're with us. Alhamdulillah. So, welcome okay. back, Kaiser. Kaiser, we prayed for you. So, I'm very happy to see you here today. <sighs> How are you doing? Mm. Feeling better now? Thank, thanks, ma'am. Thanks, ma uh, thanks ma'am. I, uh, I have already recovered. Recovered. Um, um. Okay, so. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. Any questions? Yes, sir. I'll try it. Do any question, doctor? I have a question from the uh, participant. Abdullah Mamun, please ask your question. Uh, as Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, in case of coronary perforation, uh, is that iatrogenic fat embolization done to manage that perforation? Is it uh, done yes. in our country? Uh, well, actually, uh, this uh, when uh, we were starting our CTO program, we used to have Japanese operators come very often, especially a very close friend of us, Dr. Shumit Shuzi. So he would come and he had this, you know, box. So he's a CTO operator. So he had this box and in this box, he had all kinds of gadgets with which to uh, close things. And we've learned such a lot from him. So he used to use this uh, pack. I personally have not used it, but he did use it once in a small perforation. But I personally don't have any experience of using that. 
So, I mean, a call is a lot easier to put, right? So, if a small business corporation offers, I would say, go for a call if you have it in your share. Okay, uh, Dr. Ashokda, Ashok Dr. with so, us. Dr. Ashok Dr. with us. He raised hand, I think, some question from raised hand. Yes, yeah. Ashok, unmute. Unmute. Mute. Unmute. Uh, Ashok, Ashok you have to unmute. Ashok, we, we are not listening. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, okay. Shunta Pachi. Ashok Shunta Pachi. Ashok. Madam, thank you very much. You want case that I see. You want case that I see. You want ball on. Uh, uh, Jalal sir, Asen, Udut sir, Asen, Mohsin, Shabai ke, Amar Salam. Uh, it is an excellent program. Uh, just, uh, I raise my hand to thank everybody. <laughs> oh, so you are looking at glamour. Please color your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Thank you. Mosin, is there any uh, question? Let me see. Uh, for pot, one size larger balloon is used. Can we use semi compliant or compliant balloon for pot? If used at how much pressure maximally can be pushed a little? So uh, there's a school of thought, especially for the left knee disease. For pot report, they use semi-compliant balloon because they want to be absolutely sure that the struts are properly opposed to the wall. So a school of thought, they propose that, especially for left wing, when you are doing pot report, use semi-compliant balloon. Yes. So and, and the size and the pressure depends upon the operator, right? So you have to go... Like with the NC balloon, you have to go to a very high pressure because semi compliant, it's a, a bit less than that, right? You, so it will vary according to your rated burst pressure. No, no, thank you. In fact, uh, in uh, my shelf, uh, rarely we use any semi compliant balloon. Most of the balloon is not compliant balloon. We so also use the NC you, balloon. I'm not sure the NC is fully. So that's why. <laughs> Really non-compliant balloon for expand. There is advantage of non-compliant balloon if you want to expand a, a vessel. It is really more than 4.5, more than 4, you are taking a, a, a 3.5 balloon. You don't have any other things if you inflate it. There is a chance it will expand it. But I, I think the right size, if you take right size balloon, correspond with the size of the vessel, go up to 20 atmosphere, nothing will happen. And all you need to that measure the, the actual size of the vessel. If left man, you can measure it by IVAS. If it is more than 4.5, take a 4.5 balloon. It was 3.5 or 4, or 4 millimeter balloon. Even if it is non compliance, it will not go uh, too high. Maybe uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, it can increase. So if it is 4.5, take a non compliant uh, 4.5 balloon and go to nominal if necessary. You can go up to the 20 atmosphere. And <coughs> my practice. I don't have any uh, semi compliant balloon in my shelf. Yeah, we also Jaman use NC Mohan. Jaman sir, uh, can, can uh, you one use question? In balloon, can you use, you start, and uh, madam also, you Sorry? start OPN, high pressure, very high pressure, super uh -huh. pressure. Opian, opian balloon. Opian. Uh -huh. No, 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 I have not used this. No, no. But the thing is that, yes, there is a very few occasion you need to crack the, uh, uh, the, the lesion, uh, very fibro calcific lesion with a very high pressure. But I can say uh, most of the uh, calcific lesion, if not severe circumferential calcium, can be handled with uh, what we have got um, for flex or, or we've got. Uh, okay double wire technique go to a, a, with a 20 atmosphere that can that can crack the lesion Mahonjan, sir you are telling that the nc balloon should be the size of the stent like uh, that is a, if the stent diameter is four then nc balloon 
should should take the four uh, in case of some strain uh, in the third generation strain which can be uh, more infl inflatable that is if it is uh, size is four then it can be inflated up to the 4.5 or 5 then we can uh, take the uh, nc balloon is more bigger size Uh, uh, actually, stent on vessel size. That's the important thing. Actually, the actually, you should you should not cross the vessel size. Then there is a chance of infection. You must be careful about don't be more than the vessel size. If you feel yeah. non-compliance, advantage is that even if you go up to its twenty uh, atmosphere, it will not expand and to that extent. Hardly it will go four point one. So if yeah. you go in a nominal. So it will be four millimeter. So that is the advantage of non-compliance. Definitely, uh, usually we take these things for lip main basically. But in the mid and the and and this thing is a very you must be careful to avoid complication like rupture or perforation. Uh, Professor, I will still play college. The regular participants in our session. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am, for your excellent permanent deliberation. It was so <coughs> um, many brilliant and so case-based that uh, I uh, learned a lot. That as if I am a many-year student and you are teaching me is in my uh, in third year, uh, third part in MD student like that. I am listening like like a student in third. Thank part. you so Thank much. You, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very you. much for your excellent presentation. It Thank was you. so excellent that I commented in several ways in Facebook and also in the in the, um, uh, your. Thank um, you so much. Uh, side box also. Thank Thanks, you. madam. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Arif, do you hear me? Lost the question yeah. in the chat. Please read the question because it is a program for participants. Okay. Right, sir. Thank, Thank, you. Uh, Thank you, madam, for your excellent presentation and elaborate presentation. Uh, um, there are lots of questions. Uh, most of the questions are related to perforation. And there was also, in the meantime, the huge discussion and perforation, and a uh, few questions are already discussed. So I am mentioning the relevant question. The one question was uh, long acting nitroglycerin tablet uh, before going to catheter. Does it prevent uh, artery spasm? Long acting nitroglycerin tablet before going to catheter. Does it prevent coronary spasm? Well, actually, I uh, do not have much experience with this because we do not. Routinely give any patient any long acting nitrates before we go to the cath lab. However, right. during the PCI procedure, we always keep uh, intracoronary nitrate at hand. So we go on giving that if the pressure permits. So if the pressure is good, we go on giving intracoronary nitrates depending on the pressure. If the pressure is very good, we give 100 mics of intracoronary nitrates on a regular basis. If the pressure is low, it may be 25 or 50 micrograms that we give. But we give intracoronary nitrates during the procedure. Thank you, madam. Okay. Okay, I have not seen any uh, 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 document or any report that uh, giving long acting nitrate before a procedure actually prevents spasm. I haven't seen anything like that. Abdul Sir is here. Sir, what do you want to say? Long acting nitrate, the uh, uh, procedure is going to be for a long acting. No, 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 there is no recommendation. Oh, sorry, there is no recommendation like that. We have to give the nitroglycerin. Uh, we have to give the injection. Bolus injection, nitrate, injection nitrate in bolus. And uh, usually what we have to do, we have to always assess the vessel size and also the uh, lesion um, characteristics uh -huh. to give the nitrate. And sometimes there is spasm that can be uh, that, that can mislead. And if you get an antiglycerin, the spasm will relieve. On the other hand, if we see the exact size of the vessel, it is better to give the nitroglycerin. But we are not using it frequently, but it has to get it the nitroglycerin uh, in, in bolus doses, not in oral. There is no recommendation like that. I don't know. I have any experience for that. Sorry for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, in case of perforation, what are the situations we have to go for auto transmission of blood? I personally, we do not give auto transmission in our center. What we do is we immediately try to arrange for blood 
uh, and uh, we give that. Auto transmission, I don't have much experience with because at that time you're so stressed out yeah, and you're just pulling and giving. There's always a chance that you might put in some air and also maybe, you know, I mean, uh, humanize the blood. We personally don't have much experience with auto transfusion, but I believe that uh, if it's desperate and you have no option, of course you can try it, but we don't do it on a regular basis. Or very actually, actually, auto transfusion is appropriate when there is a temporary, because you treat the temporary as well as put the blood in. You are doing both. Right. Otherwise, uh, it's not a choice of treatment. Nah. No, that's right. That not necessary. Always you need an auto transfusion. It depends upon exactly. the how the blood is leakaging from the perforation. Yeah. I have an, one very bad experience of that. The, in the cat lab, in the RCA lesion, there is a perforation after putting up the stent, and um, uh, and then after that there is a cardiac tamponade. And at the time, one of my um, uh, colleague is trying to uh, place the uh, pictal catheter in the pericardial cavity. Then unfortunately. That uh, 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 that only that goes to the RV, and then only and the sheath was introduced in the RV, and the blood is coming up and giving that it is still not coming up. Then we have to fix up the RCA, but we cannot fix up the seal of that. Suddenly, patient was becoming uh, violent, and he, uh, the sheath was withdrawn from the RV, and that patient uh, we have to give the auto transfusion, and we send the patient for surgery, and it was repaired, and patient is improved and go home. So there is some situation uh, that is the cascade of the complication. In that case, I think so, or we can go for auto perfusion. But auto perfusion, we have to be careful about that. What Fazila mentioned, sometimes uh, embolism can go, but as you are going the venous route, so mm -hmm. microembolism by small embolism mm -hmm. should not be any problem. It will uh, it will not create any problem. If if it goes to the arterial wall, then it's a problem, real problem. But if it is a um, very small amount of the here, it should not be any problem, I think so. But we have to carefully about that, giving the blood. But we have to give in very quickly. So you have to take in one hand syringe and take it out and give quickly blood into the um, in the venous system. That you can do that. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kaiser Bhai. Kaiser Bhai. A small comment on this. Yeah. There should be a, a, a mandatory to do echocardiography yeah. within the cath lab to monitor the amount of Pericardium, not only in the cath lab, the patient should be monitored in CCU also. Because you, you may see that it has been sealed, but gradually the, the, there is a chance of expansion of the, of the, of the uh, effusion. So keep the indwelling catheter there in the pericardial space and monitor it to see the. You can also monitor the hemodynamics. That also give you a guide whether the fluid is accumulating or not. If there is further accumulation, there will be fall of blood pressure again. So patients should be monitored with echocardiography, both in the cath lab and in the CC. That is my small comment on this. Dr. Kaiser, do you hear me? Kaiser, do you hear me? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 loud and clear. I, I, I've got some tech problem. Yeah. Um, uh, just uh, three minutes. It's a brilliant presentation by Dr. Fodila Appa, as usual. Learned a lot from her, always. Um, secondly, nice initiative by IPDI, all the programs. Uh, salute to you and your team, uh, Odud Bhai and Mosin and, and uh, your team. Uh, third thing, I will, I will give uh, three comments about complications. One, if you don't have any complication in your life, you're not doing enough cases. This is for juniors. <laughs> Second, yeah. yeah. Second, if you are, have too many complications, that means you're not planning your case. You're not uh, reading your case before. And third, everybody should have a complication kit in your cath lab. Because when this happens, time matters. Time is life. So if you search for where is cover stand, where is the pigtail, where is the, that thing, you should have a pericardiosynthesis trolley. You could, should have a, uh, a cover stand coils. In you in your one box which is called complication kit box uh, these three things are very important for all intermediate cardiologists in his life and and just giving a comment about the last uh, questions that pericardiosynthesis auto transmissions so uh, what uh, when, when when the patient calls it's very important to give uh, the fluid or blood so auto transmission is a measure 
before a fresh blood comes, but it, it takes time to uh, uh, collect a fresh blood. So that the problem is that when you collect, uh, pull up through a syringe and then give it, uh, there, is, there is a chance of air embolism. So very easy technique is that you just connect the pigtail catheter's uh, mouth with the uh, uh, cordy sheet of the venous system of your uh, femoral vein uh, with a connector. But problem is that there are uh, there's no they're all male male. So you have to use a rubber sheet to connect them. As the pericard pericardial effusion <coughs> pressure is high because of pumping hard, it will automatically go from the pericardial cavity towards the venous system. You don't have to uh, pull by syringe and push it again. It is automatically good. Just you connect the, 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 the pigtail with the venous sheet of cordy sheet of the uh, femoral vein. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent demonstration. New technique for pericarditis this to the venous okay. blood. Thank you. Dr. Uh, 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 Professor Arun is here. Arun Maske? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dr. Arun Maske? Dr. Arun Maske, welcome to our session. Please unmute. Professor, Professor Arun from Nepal. I joined a little late. <laughs> okay. Least a lot. I'm a student of Fazila Ma'am in NICBD. This was excellent presentation. I have one question. So, uh, a 30 years old gentleman came with acute inferior volume, no risk factors, occluded mid RCA, uh, uh, did struggle in cath lab for two, two and a half hours, did everything balloon dilatation, thrombosuction, GP2V inhibitors. We just won. At the end, we left that patient with anotropic support. Patient becomes stable, discharged, and just for an academic interest, did an angiogram after six weeks. This vessel was recanalized three, uh, around three, three, three mm RCA. In the mid part of that vessel, there's an aneurysm around 5.6. Asymptomatic. So, how should I treat that patient? This so, did, so it was your patient, Arun. Tell yeah. me, what did you do? You tell us what you no, did. I was the patient had uh, 32 years work, occluded. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yes. But the thing is, you that did that. So uh, later on, you found that there was an aneurysm that was asymptomatic. So my question is, when you did that and you found the aneurysm, what did you do? You tell us. We learned from you. I'm that patient medically now. Exactly. Yeah. And my question is, how should I follow this patient? Do I need to do a CT scan just to see if the sizes are increasing? Or just treat patient medically, do nothing, see, how, uh, see his symptoms? This is a just young, 32 years old gentleman. I yeah. tried to do this research, I cannot get answers. So this is my opportunity to ask my teacher. So, uh, well, uh, we've got uh, so many legendary figures here. We can ask, because this is a hypothetical question, Urun. And what I think is whatever you're doing it must be fine because your patient is doing well. So personally, if that were my patient, I would have asked him to do lifestyle modification, you know, take care of himself and uh, give uh, up his statins. And uh, obviously, I would give him dual antiplatelets. Whether I would... Uh, uh, and whether I would do a CT to monitor his uh, uh, the aneurysm, I don't think I would. Would you do that? Dr. Professor Mangalijaman, sir, do you hear me? Any comments? Aneurysm, follow up of the aneurysm? Any uh, aneurysm? No? Yeah, we are all are interested to dilate the stenosed vessel. But rarely we think about to make small size of the aneurysm of the segment. Yes, there is a uh, option for treatment of aneurysm when you feel that there is a chance of rupture of the aneurysm. Yeah. Uh, the usually, uh, aneurysm itself will not produce any symptom as such. But the, the, the RCA, it's an infarct-related vessel. Even if you don't do anything uh, to, to treat the vessel, nothing will happen. But if, if there is any chance of uh, in the, the chance of rupture by if you see the um, follow up the monitor um, uh, the patient by CT NGO and if you feel that it is increasing it is increasing then it should be tackled by putting a cover stent that is my suggestion usually 1.5 times bigger than the uh, 
uh, then the original size is called aneurysm. But say, for example, the vessel is gradually increasing. So every six months you are doing CT angio, it is increasing. So there is a chance of rapture. In that case, simple procedure to put a cover stent that can prevent rapture. <coughs> what actually uh, the, the fazila oh. showed one patient uh, to occlude the aneurysm means that it is just close the vessel by embolizing coil. Here you don't need to embolize this. You just put a cover stent. That 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 cover stent will seal the aneurysm if it is suitable with the cover stent. That is my suggestion. So, so do you advise doing a CT angiogram uh, regularly in this patient? At least six months you can. Can I, can I, can I do one line? Oh, one by one. Sir, sir just Khalid Bosin sir, do, uh, uh, raise, raise his hand. Khalid Bosin sir, do you add something? Uh, I, 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 from our experts, that does the use of ETO treated or chemical treated predilection balloon plays any role in the creation of coronary artery aneurysm? Is there any uh, such uh, etiology? Definitely no, no. regarding. No, 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 Infection to act a car on a car subcontinent aneurysm, Jota Pojai, Uno Sapojina, it could be a news billon akin to aneurysm hoteparezodi infection hoi, reuse akin to hotepar. On a show holoki, a blood leg attack, said a key, ETO corona really difficult. Acta is steady hoteparish at a old generation, new generation, third generation, second generation. I agree with Momino Jaman by definitely if the and the size is less than 1.5, then we should we tackle with med medication. We can follow up the patient by CT and you can other. But if the size is bigger, much more than, and there is a chance of the rupture, then I think so either we have to fix up with the covered stand or if necessary, multiple aneurysm. If there is a, then we can send the patient to surgery also. That's a different issue. But also, size, also you something? I mean, uh, somebody, I might, to, yeah. somebody might think that there is a chance of, high chance of re -stenosis. So, mm -hmm. if you put a cover stain, there is a chance of re -stenosis. I think re it that is not that life pattern <laughs> compared to rapture of the aneurysm. Right, sir. Exactly, sir. Uh, I like to share with the moment, Jaman, 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 sir. Uh, several, several years back, uh, one of my relatives uh, developed uh, aneurysm at the distal end in the medial lady uh, uh, after putting a stain, appropriate uh, post dilatation, everything have uh, done. Uh, but it was in months, uh, little uh, after the three months, develop a uh, little fever and some um, uh, illness, acute illness, flu like symptom. After that, we did the check in Jogam, and there is a uh, moderate size aneurysm in the distal end of the uh, drug looting stand or generation. Uh, I sent it to Mamuni Jaman sir. Mamuni Jaman sir told that it is nothing to do, uh, flow is maintaining distally. And uh, and also took I took the opinion from the surgeon. They are also not happy because single vessel disease and having aneurysm. But uh, unfortunately, I share my uh, uh, I like to share uh, my experience that uh, uh, relative suddenly died, sudden cardiac death happened. So uh, my conclusion in my conclusion, aneurysm is the harbinger of uh, cardiac arrest, acute LBA. When it rupture any any port, BP fluctuation or any illness acute illness or on any fever or any inflammation, then anything may be happened and sudden death is usually occurred. So I think there is... Uh, um, all, all, how many days, how many days uh, actually if the patient collapse from the diagnosis? Up, uh, uh, just after uh, visit you, after within six months of visiting you. Uh, can I add something? He has no symptom. Suddenly, one, one day, he is a father of doctors. Uh, and his uh, daughter is in uh, UK, so I feel. Uh, yeah. Pajis, Pajis, do you add something? Yeah. Pajis, yeah. Uh, sometimes the aneurysm could be mitotic aneurysm due to related to infection. That may be related to as Khalakosin Bhai was saying. They could it be due to uh, improperly sterilized uh, reused uh, material? That could be a reason. In those cases, you cannot be.
assured of the slow progression of the aneurysm because not only the hemodynamics but also the inflammatory process is actually uh, acting in the process of uh, gradual uh, enlargement of the aneurysm. In those cases, uh, actually surgical intervention may be required earlier, but in this case we have to have close uh, follow-up by CTNGO, that will be better. Otherwise, as a whole, aneurysm progression is very slow most of the time. Okay, last one. Dr. Shudish Shah, do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to ask the questions. So, Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. Uh, I would like to thank and congratulate you for the awesomely good presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you are really a unique presenter, and I'm letting you know that I'm a big fan of your accent. And you are a proof that age is just a number. I have a question regarding, uh, it might sound silly, but it's regarding medical legal aspect of the hazards we might end up in the cat lab. Though it's a neglected topic in the country like ours. But the question is how we might be charged medical legally if we end up with coronary perforation or something like that. And unfortunately, we could not save the patient. This is the question. I mean, uh, that is a nightmare for all of us, isn't it? Uh, and uh, this can happen to anyone. You start a procedure, it's a simple thing, and then uh, you lose your patient. That is a nightmare that uh, uh, no one wants to have. But if the consequences vary, right? Like if you can, uh, if you have a good rapport with your patient and their relatives and all, and you have already explained to the patient that these are the potential and the relatives also these are the potential happen you have taken the consent and also you have uh, and the patient's party is understanding then usually they will accept the faith right but sometimes there are patients and relatives who can get very emotional may even turn violent and even cause breakage of hospital and lot and later even you know uh, manhandle a physician so the spectrum is very wide and if unfortunately for our part of the world we do not have a safety net uh, the doctors do not and i think today is a day when we have all such regions with us in the field of intervention cardiology in bangladesh we should i think create an insurance or a safety net or something. We have founded the Society of Coronary Intervention, which is a great endeavor, and all of you have uh, have served there and have worked there and have elevated it to greater heights. But maybe you know uh, what he has pointed out is very relevant, and we should uh, learn uh, and take better steps to safeguard ourselves against uh, certain accidents like this. What do you say, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mumino Zaman? Any yeah. comments? No, 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 basically, uh, basically uh, uh, now the time what we passed safely, we came up to this without much uh, uh, problem on us. Although I have still two, three case, uh, case I am just uh, my with. lawyer is going to court. But sufferings. Yeah, uh, sufferings is there, but I do believe the juniors they are really in in, in in danger in future because people they know sometimes in a way that they know better than you by going to google going to youtube they explain you the, you have done mistake like this way you have not done this way so there should be first of all uh, uh, you must be very much uh, acquainted with the guideline you should follow the guideline you should not do something uh, of your own so guideline will protect you uh, uh, by law second one is that you should explain things detailed with the patient party both pre during and after so that they will at least absorb the possible come even it happened in the best possible best operator in the world it can happen but if if cannot if if you cannot explain to the patient the patient will not take it easily they will bang on you so there should be first of all you follow the guideline second you should maintain a good conversation with the patient relative patient relative i'm talking about patient relative not the patient because once the patient is in a crash so he will not say anything 
patient related third definitely many of the situation is because of comment given by our colleague that is the fact so i think it is a multifactorial definitely legal protection is we need uh, if not for me for you also everybody are at risk of having this problem in future so it is fazila said that yes there should be a uh, there should be insurance coverage of all these things that can at least financially you can protect otherwise this is this not only your psychological trauma it also financial trauma to you okay so there is a, now it is a time to make a, a insurance group insurance whatever you say to protect our junior cardiologist this is my comment thank, thank you we are already only two hours we yes, are now passing two time dr arif dr arif uh, dr arif do you hear me लोडी थे भलो है फर्चुनेटली and the case was diminished and i rescued that that is the history actually this is the happening kajai zaman bhai kajai kintu protection kintu fazila jeta bolche i must apni jeta counseling ta korei ba amra korte aisi tar poreo kintu beshi onek kichu thake jeta hole ki protection er jonno amader kintu dorkar legality dorkar amader society amader dorkar legality kintu dorkar that's important kintu amader ekta legality Mostly. lawyer dorkar bishesh kore amader आलोचना करते प्रोटेक्शन गाइडलैंड that will be a legal protector for everybody i said by do it something uh, three Mr. points Kaiser. three points ekta holo jeta bodhbe bollo ekta likhito kagoj thakte hobe amra amader hospital e korchi eta ekdom bangla kothay bangla bang rejite je okhane lekha thakte hobe rogir mrittu hote pare ei kotha ta clearly lekha thakte hobe bolte hobe ami kintu abar rogi ke boli ekhane 1% chance apni mara jete paren ar khab rogi ke boli apnake last ni ghor jete hobe दस टाइम खर्च हो 
আর লিখিত দরকার হবে কারণ পরের রোগীর উল্টা যায় সাইন থাকলে তখন সে উল্টালে বলতো এই আমি নিয়েছি এবং আমি যখন কাউন্সিলিং করি আমি একটা রুমে করি যে রুমের উপরে একটা ক্যামেরা আছে ওখানে রেকর্ড হয় এবং আমি রোগীকে বলে নি রেকর্ডেড যাতে পরে যদি সে উল্টে যায় ডকুমেন্ট থাকে এক দুই নম্বর যে কথাটা মামুন ইজাম স্যার বললেন নিজেদের কলিগকে যদি কিছু বলতে হয় সেটা আপনি ফোনে বলেন এটা আপনি ফোনে বলেন রুহিকে বলেন না রুহিকে বলে আপনি শুধুমাত্র নিজের সহজাতিকে ছোট করতেছেন এরকম অনেক ঘটনা করছে একটা না আমি যখন পাঁচ থেকে আমি এখন তো নাই যখন ছিলাম আমি তখন আমি এরকম একটা না আমি বলবো কমপক্ষে দশ থেকে পনেরোটা আমি কেস পেয়েছি যেখানে আমার কলিগ আরেক কলিগের এগেনস্টে মানে কিছু বলেছে আমার প্রয়াত ফ্রেন্ড লিটু ও একটা প্রবলেম পড়েছিল ওর নাম বললাম কিন্তু মারা গেছে ওর এই প্রবলেমেও ও আমাদেরই কিছু কলিগ কিছু কমেন্ট করেছিল যেটা করা ঠিক না ভুল আমি করতেই পারি আমি মানুষ আমাকে আপনি বলতে পারেন বড় ভাই ছোট ভাই ফ্রেন্ড বলতে পারেন আলাদা করে ফোনে ডেকে বলেন রুমে ডেকে নিয়ে বলেন কিন্তু রুইকে বলাটা মোটেই ঠিক না ভুল সবাই করে এটা তোমার সেকেন্ড পয়েন্ট আর থার্ড পয়েন্ট লিগাল অ্যাডভাইজার হুইল বি অ্যাপয়েন্টেড ফ্রম বিএসটিআই অথবা কার্ড সোসাইটি তাকে একটা মান্থলি অ্যালাউন্স দেওয়া হবে প্রশাসনের কোনো কাজ হয় না যখন কেস আসবে তখন তাকে একটু বেশি দেওয়া হবে এটা দরকার সব জায়গায় আছে থ্যাংক ইউ আমি সব শুনেছি আমি তখন যে ইয়ে করলাম যে তোমরা যেটা করছো দয়া করে ওদিকে জানা সেই জিনিসটা এরকম so uh, yeah, it is yeah, another yeah. backup support yeah. of your it's, comment that's a good idea that's a good idea no alum only 30 seconds and only information our para majhe tai kore ami dekhi actually actually i learned a lot from today's session especially the last issue the legal issue which is raised uh, uh, of course we will uh, raise in our uh, ec meeting uh, both uh, bcs and bsci uh, i am a, also a fan of uh, ma'am like shudhir Uh, when ma'am presented uh, in a left main series uh, actually it was amazing when ma'am ma'am present left main series thank you ma'am uh, just i would like to know uh, on issue uh, i don't know if it is relevant or not but how are you uh, tackling cath lab procedures in this covid covid era just your cath lab uh, approaches <coughs> in covid era just like to know in heart foundation in uh, well in heart foundation uh, what we are doing basically nowadays we are doing uh, acute coronary syndrome patients like mainly patients come with st segment elevation mi or uh, some other acute coronary syndrome they are symptomatic so after we give them uh, uh, medical uh, treatment uh, we send for their covid test once the covid test comes only when it comes negative do we take them to the cath lab to do angiogram and if required to do Uh, PCI. So basically, uh, acute coronary syndrome patients who are hospitalized and who are not responding to treatment, uh, medical treatment, are still symptomatic. Uh, only after COVID testing are we doing their PCI and angiogram. So like today, we did six PCIs and uh, these were all acute coronary syndrome patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last question from the Dr. Abdullah Al Manjur. Dr. Abdullah Al-Manjur, do you hear me? Dr. Manjur? Manjur, Anvir. Yeah. Okay. The last, the last question. Uh, Dr. Manjur? We do not hear you. We do not hear you, Manjur. 
Mr. Rikul, we are here. Dr. Aris, do you hear me? Dr. Aris? Sir. Uh, your yes, last, sir. Uh, last question from the chat box. Okay, sir. Uh, there is an interesting question from Birat. Uh, he wanted to know when we have planned for put a covered stand, but size is not available. In that case, whether we can convert in your conventional stand to a covered stand and any, any technique there? Yes, uh, actually, uh, there is. Uh, it's uh, uh, presented in TCT last year from our hospital, and uh, uh, it, it's you take a balloon, cut the balloon piece. And basically, between two stems, you place the balloon. So you have to have a double layer of balloon there. So you take one stem out. So there is your balloon. And you put the layer and you put the second uh, stem there. Crimp it over and then take it. But it's very bulky. You know, if you made a, if you make a homemade uh, uh, covered stem, it is usually very bulky. And it is difficult to take. Uh, so that is a challenge. And I think it's also risky also. also. And the also. of the stand. De so. Definitely. So a homemade cover stand, I would not recommend. Uh, it's always smart to have the cover stands uh, ready on the Different. shelf. But if you have no other option, option and you, can you, do that. Uh, you have, this is your last measure, then you can do that. You can do that. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, IPD, for nice organizing this type of session. And again, the madam is excellent regarding her deliberating, informating speech. Thank you. And uh, thank you, sir? everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Wadhu, sir, we have uh, already left <laughs> for the two hours back. <laughs> So yeah. We have had a very good time indeed. Thank you. Thank we you have everybody. met so many of our colleagues, friends, teachers. Uh, uh, can you give any information about the, the, our friend or junior has suffering already suffering from COVID? Uh, yeah. How is Jamal? How is Manzoor? Jamal Pai has gone. Uh, Jamal home. sir, Jamal sir, bhalo asse, sir. Bhalo bhalo asse, asse, Manzoor. Manzoor. Manzoor is okay. He is okay. Improving, sir. Manzoor is okay. मेडिकल Around 25 of them has become infected among 84, 85 doctors. So that means around 50 doctors are infected. Almost sir, all of them are asymptomatic. Sir, Professor Jalal sir, uh, want to say something? Professor Jalal sir. Sir, एक तो एक तो कथा बोलते हैं जो ना जैसे आज के प्रो डॉक्टर मोमिन जमान एस वेल एस डॉक्टर कायसर इज हियर टुडे फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम एंड आई एम वेरी हैप्पी दैट Dr. Kaiser has recovered from his illness. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Zaman the other day told me that when he started doing the uh, angioplasty for the first time in Bangladesh in NICU, yeah. he lost the uh, stent. Stent. First stent I lost. First. Stent. First That is your business. Right coronary, yes. right coronary that artery. Your yes. uh, that was the Johnson and Johnson. First, yes. Johnson and Johnson Keep is the government. Yes. No, no. Cover long. Cover st the sh delivery sheet. Uh, you may, uh, the new. Uh, you, uh, I yes. think the uh, the Wadud. Uh, uh, I think they are, you have not seen that one. The whole whole stain with balloon was yes. covered with a long sheet. उट 
that at that time yes. i was director of the hospital and it was a it was my duty je amar student ke amar highlight kora even he is in problem amake tar highlight kora and highlight korte korte ami take onek i korchi appreciate korchi ebong later on he did very well in his intervention uh, site in bangladesh not only that later on what happened one night i had pain in chest and after within 15 minutes at late night or uh, just midnight i went to the kumonis jawan in uh, united hospital on on the way that my chest pain disappeared and because i when i was getting chest pain immediately i took four tablets of ipusvin which i was i just continuing from before thik ebu bar bar ami in spray nichilam nitrate spray nichilam to jete jete rasta ai dekhi je amar chest pain ta kome gelo tar pore jao emergency e gelam emergency jawar pore ami bollam je ami to ekhane doctor amake bhorti korun nen doctor mohan jawan doctor kaisar doctor oh hey amar is another student doctor fatima is there i was very much ami khub sahosh pachhilam je tara tin jon very good cardiologist as here at the moment i was leading the position at that time in united hospital amake bhorti kore dilo tokhon mohan jawan chilo na oi din tara ishe jawar kotha oi select ta amake bhorti kora holo oi riyan elander Dr. Ian was working with me in uh, Levitt Hospital for a long time. I was very happy with her also. Therefore, uh, mo- early morning, Dr. Mohan Jawan as well as Dr. Kaisar came to see me. And they were going to uh, Silet. I told him, we go to Silet. You come back and then see me. Thick that poor day, Shokale, the rash look. আশার পর দুজনে আমাকে দেখলেন তো মোহন জান বলেন যে তখন আমি একটু সাহস পাইলাম যে তাহলে বোধ হয় বড় এমআই কিছু আমি বললাম যে আমি বয়স এখন সেভেন্টি সিক্স আমার বলি মোহন জাহন বলছে মোহন জাহন টুকু Dr. Mohan was very happy and Kaisar was also very happy to uh, be over there. Then, the angiogram could have followed the MRP to test and lab it. In the right coronary, as well as in the left uh, LED. I am a good actor. 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 হ্যাপি I express my gratitude to both of my students that they saved my life in the uh, by the grace of almighty Allah actually sir I'm so, right after the great uh, I'm so happy today that I was treated my students both uh, Mohan Jawan as well as Dr. Kaisa uh, and also Dr. Riyan over there Fatima was out of station at that time. 
and thank you very much. I feel my again and again gratitude to my my students, Dr. Mohammed Jawan, Dr. Kaisar. मालिक सब मैंटी To be a cardiologist under his guidance. I am just even to ask him. Just to go, I am the worst person. It was my uh, luck and also the help of Professor Bigger Abdul Malik. When he did the work, my institute was not for them. That's why I am even to ask him. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. 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 खुब दुख पाई जो प्रफेसर अबू जाफर सहेब यूनिटेड हासपाल भर्ती हमें घर थे even ami upor tal theke nish dalao dite parchi na the condition is so amra ekhon amra tar jonno ekta dua korbo pore shobai je professor amar subject bhalo after sir please after sir no pastor ologe thank you thank you the speaker for your presentation sob shomoy to as usual great presenter ar ki and very nicely present korche ar ki are very interactive session আর সিনিয়রদের প্রতি জালাল স্যার এবং সরসি অ্যাসিস্ট্যান্ট প্রফেসর অনেক দিন কাজ করছি আমি জাফর স্যার অ্যাসিস্ট্যান্ট এসে ছিলাম মালিক স্যার সাথে আমার কাজ করার সুযোগ হয়েছে আমি যখন স্টুডেন্ট ছিলাম তখন মালিক স্যার ডিরেক্টর ছিলেন কাজেই আই हैव एन গ্রেট অপরচুনিটি টু ওয়ার্ক উইথ হিম সো আই অ্যাম রিয়েলি গ্রেটফুল এবং আমি এনআইসিবি সবকিছু দেখছি যে হাউ দা এনআইসিবি ইজ কামিং আপ হাউ দা এনআইসিবি বিল্ড আপ পুরান বিল্ডিং কি নতুন বিল্ডিং এ কিভাবে যাওয়া হলো কিভাবে গেল এবং জাফর স্যার আমাকে অর্ডার একদিন করলো যে আজকের মধ্যে আপনাকে সিসু শিফট করতে হবে ইশাদের সময় আই हैव टू শিফট দা এনআইসিবি টু উইদিন ওয়ান ডে मोहसिनिंग getting worst day by day in bangladesh so our frontliners colleagues seniors juniors are uh, so much work in the high tension risk so uh, we should do for our colleagues and everybody ipdi takes some initiatives uh, we uh, just group of doctors from from the chest physicians and also internist critical memory medicine we are doing a group of doctors doing for the juniors if you this we have just a step for few things for do what to do ek din ek junior phone kore amake rat dite bolche je 
স্যার আমি বাঁচতে বাঁচতে চাই আমি আগে বলছি হস করে মরতে চাই রাত দুইটায় এই যে একটা ছেলের সাথে আমরা কানেক্ট করছি রাত দুইটায় তিনটার সময় আমি ডক্টর আরিফ ডক্টর তানভি ডক্টর তুষার এবং তারা কথা বলছে আমাদের সাথে এতটুক আমরা একটা স্মৃতি বন্ধন করতে যাচ্ছি জুনিয়রদের সাথে কলিগদের সাথে যাচ্ছে এবং ওয়াদুস স্যার আমাদের সময় দিচ্ছেন ডক্টর অবেদ আমিন আমরা আবদুল সাথে কথা বলছি ফোনে স্যার কি করতে পারি এবং এখানে আমি সবাইকে অনুরোধ করব যে আপনারা প্লিজ একটা হোয়াটসঅ্যাপ নম্বরে ক্লিক করবেন আমরা চেষ্টা করবো আপনাদের পাশে থাকার জন্য আমরা এর মধ্যে কিন্তু অনেককে আমরা পাঁচ অক্সিজেনটা বাসায় দিয়ে এসেছি আমরা অক্সিজেন সিলিন্ডার দিয়ে আসতেছি আমরা চেষ্টা করছি টাই সামথিং আমরা জানি অনেকেই করছেন তবে আমরা চেষ্টা করছি উই শুড ডু ফর দ্য জুনিয়র্স অ্যান্ড কলিগস অ্যান্ড সিয়ার বিকজ অলরেডি উই লস্ট সিক্সটি টু ডক্টরস ইন বাংলাদেশ আই আই ডোন্ট নো নেক্সট মান্থ উই লস্ট হাউ মেনি ডক্টরস ইন ইয়ার ফিউচার সো আই আই পিল এভরিবডি প্লিজ do for something for the colleagues they are frontline fighters we raise our voice to the government and non government for doing their best thank you sir uh what uh, is sir yeah, okay it's only please comment je koto guru manoshik sthoito jata ebong shat proyojon ho bonojo dhore rekhe dhone program kore khub kothin hoye jacche mosid jeta bolchilo बेचे आलो हिसाब से मालिक असाधारण लेकिन दिन शुद्म ज्ञान बढ़ालो অভিজ্ঞতা বাড়ালো কাজের ক্ষমতা বাড়ালো সেটা না আমাদের মনে কিন্তু আশা যুগালো আমরা আশা হারাবো না আমরা সামনে গিয়ে যাব আজকে এখানে আমাদের সবার গুরু জালাল স্যার এত মনোযোগী ছাত্র হিসেবে এখানে ছিলেন আজকে এখানে লিজেন্ডারি ইন্টারভেনশনিস্ট মনোজন ভাই আছেন আজকে এখানে অসাধারণ অর্গানাইজার এন এস সিভিটি প্রাক্তন ডিরেক্টর আব্দুল রহমান স্যার আছেন আমাদের একদম জুনিয়ররা আছেন এই যে খুব অ্যাক্টিভ যারা আছেন যেমন আমাদের নূর আছে আমাদের এখানে আছে এই যে সবাই মিলে যে আমরা চেষ্টা করছি এটা কিন্তু মমিচন ভাই একবার বলেছিলেন উনি ওনার মায়ের এনজোগ্রাম করেছিলেন তো সেটা নিয়ে কথা হচ্ছিল আমি ওনার মায়ের প্রাথমিক ভর্তি হওয়ার পরে কেয়ারের দায়িত্বে ছিল মনটা আমাকে বললো আমি যদি আমার মায়ের এনজোগ্রাম করার ক্ষমতা না রাখি তাহলে আমি অন্যের এনজোগ্রাম কিভাবে করবো উনার সে আলো পত্রিকা ধরে আমি কিন্তু আমার সব আত্মীয়স্বজন আমার নিজের শ্বশুরের আমার নিজের ভাইয়ের সবার এনজোগ্রাম এনজোপ্লাস্টি এগুলো করেছি পেসমেকার এগুলো সব করেছি উনাদের শিক্ষা থেকে জেলা আপা নিজের স্বামীর করেছে যে এই যে জিনিসগুলো আমরা যে করছি শিখছি এই এটার জন্য আমাদের থাকে এই যে স্যার বলছিলেন আজকে জালা স্যার যে আমাদেরকে আলো পত্রিকা জ্বালিয়ে গেছেন তার ধরে কিন্তু আজকে মমিজন ভাই আফজাল স্যার ফজিলা আপা এরা উঠে আসছেন তাদের পরে আমরা উঠে আসছি আমরা কিন্তু এই অনুষ্ঠানগুলোর মাধ্যমে সেটাই করে যেতে চাচ্ছি আমি অসুস্থ হলে যেন আমার ছাত্র আমাকে সুচিকিৎসা দিতে পারে আমি সুনিশ্চিত ভাবে তার হাতে নিজেকে সমর্পণ করতে পারি সেই আশা নিয়ে কোভিড থেকে বেঁচে থাকার আশা নিয়ে আল্লাহ রহমতের আশা নিয়ে আজকে এখানে শেষ করছি thank you everyone especially professor fazila madam excellent presentation also munir jaman sir was jalal sir abdul sir ashole amra shuru korechilam ipdi onek asha niye kintu ekhon kintu protite class korte je amar khub koshto hoye jay karon jokhon dr monoharil amra jana ja pori tokhon ashole porobortti class amar jonno pore chaliyo jak kothin hoye jay ashole proti din e bhabe phone ashte thake it is tough to continue plus what sir jeta bollen we should continue because it is our regular work but uh, আমি জানি না যে এখন আমাদের ফিউচার কি যাবে থ্যাংকস এভরিবডি যার পার্টিসিপেন্টস এর মধ্যে প্রায় দুশো কস করেছিল পার্টিসিপেন্টস থ্যাংকস এভরি পার্টিসিপেন্টস এভরিবডি আওয়ার নেক্সট ক্লাস ইজ এ ডিফারেন্ট টাইপ ক্লাস ইয়ার ওয়ান অফ দ্য পাইনিয়র লেকচার ডক্টর অনিল সাক্সেনা অনিল সাক্সেনা ইজ দ্য রাইট পার্সন টু টক অ্যাবাউট পেস মেকার ইট ইজ অল দ্য এবিসি ফর দ্য পেস মেকার ফর দ্য জুনিয়র্স আই থিঙ্ক অন দ্য সানডে অ্যাট থ্রি পি এম ডক্টর অনিল সাক্সেনা ইজ হেয়ার টিল দেন Goodbye assalamu alaikum stay home and take care thank you thank you thank you assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum
uh, I thank also Dr. Incepta Pharmaceuticals. I missed Incepta doing a lot for the last one month, and Dr. Arif also doing a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you.